Hi, I'm Dan Bauer and welcome to CBA Office Hours, where Patrick Hearn and I talk about issues and frequently asked questions that come up in the context of the behavioral and health and social sciences and statistical analyses. Um, today what I'm going to talk about is a question that arises when implementing multi-level models, and that's how large of a sample size do I need to have, in particular how many clusters do I need to have in order to confidently use these models and trust the estimates that I obtain. Um, so first, by way of just a little bit of background, I'm going to describe what multi-level models are and what they're used for, and then I'm going to go into the particular issue of uh, the small sample size and how low can we go in terms of the number of clusters and still obtain accurate estimates. Um, I'll talk about some techniques we can use to obtain reasonably accurate estimates even with relatively few clusters, um, and then uh, sort of wrap up by what do we do if we have even fewer than that. Um, so again, just to start with, I'm going to talk about when we use multi-level models and what those models look like. Um, so to begin, these are models that we use to analyze nested data. Nested data typically uh, comes in one of two types. We can have hierarchically clustered data, hierarchically nested data, where we have individuals nested within groups. A classic example of that is kids nested within schools. Um, and we also have longitudinally nested data, uh, so repeated measures nested within person. I'm going to particularly focus on the hierarchical case. Uh, Patrick Hearn has another video where he talks about multi-level growth models for repeated measures, observations, nested within persons. Um, so I'm going to focus more on the hierarchical case. If you're interested in that longitudinal case, you can see that other video. But everything I'm going to talk about here today is going to be equally applicable in that longitudinal context. So as an example of hierarchically clustered data, let's say that we were interested in evaluating the effect of a new math curriculum. And so we do a cluster randomized trial. We select 10 schools and we randomly assign five schools to be in the control condition. They're sort of the treatment as usual, the, the standard math curriculum. And then we have five schools that are in the treatment condition and they get the new math curriculum. And so we have uh, five units in the control, five schools. And then in the treatment, we also have five schools, so schools 6 through 10. So those are our, our 10 schools. And so this is a relatively small number of clusters, a relatively small number of schools. And so for these five, we have treatment as zero, and for these five, we have treatment as one. So that's our control condition, and that's our, our treatment condition. Now, within each of those 10 schools, we're going to sample multiple students, and we're going to assess their math achievement at the end of the curriculum. So at the end of the school year, which students do better in math achievement. And so we might sample a bunch of students from school one and a bunch of students from school two and school five. And every school we're going to sample multiple students from. And so we have really two levels of sampling. We have level one, the student, and we have level two, the cluster or the school. Now, we might sample lots and lots of students from each of these schools. So we might sample, you know, let's, let's go extreme. Let's say we had as many as 100 students per school. Well, then we have a total of 1,000 observations across the 10 schools, but we still only have 10 schools. So the number of clusters is still small, and that number of clusters is what's going to largely dictate the performance of our estimators when we go to fit multi-level models. All right, so in this hierarchically clustered context, we use multi-level models to address a key problem, which is that there's dependence in the data. So many of our, our tried and true uh, try and tr tried and true uh, statistical techniques like the linear regression model, the ANOVA model, are going to assume independence of observations. But in this case, we might expect that the math achievement scores of students who all attend the same school might be weakly correlated with one another because maybe similar kinds of kids go to that particular school. Um, and so these kids are going to be maybe more similar to one another than kids from different schools because they share that same school context, and so they're subject to same of those, some of those same school effects. They have the same kinds of teachers, the same administrative uh, units in place, the same general school culture that they're experiencing. They may also be similar to one another because they have selection effects, that there are uh, certain families that want their kids to attend particular schools, and so they tend to live in the neighborhoods that go to those, those schools. So we might expect students within school one to be a little bit similar to one another in their math achievement, likewise for school two, likewise for school five, six, seven, ten. Any observations that we sample within those particular schools we might expect to be sort of similar. So school one might be a high performing school and all the kids within that school tend to be a little above the overall average. 
And school five might be a low performing school and kids within that school tend to be a little below the average in general. All right, so because of that tendency for, for observations to be somewhat similar to one another within a given cluster, we have dependence in the data. We have correlated observations and that violates the independence assumption of many statistical models. The multi-level model is one way of accounting for the dependence that's in that data. It's not the only way. There are other things we can do with nested data. We can fit uh, kind of standard general linear models like regression or ANOVA and correct the standard errors for the cluster correlation of those observations. Uh, we can do a fixed effects modeling approach that's very popular in econometrics. Uh, we can do GEE modeling, which is very popular in health research. But within the behavioral and social sciences and educational sciences, the multi-level model is one of the most popular approaches for dealing with nested data. And one of the reasons for that is that it, it takes that dependence in the data and rather than treat that as a nuisance that we have to, to somehow deal with to get accurate tests, we actually use that as a source of information from which to learn more about our data and the population from which we obtained it. All right, so I'm gonna take this example and I'm now gonna kind of write out what a multi-level model would look like for this data. And so in this case, what we're interested in is evaluating whether math achievement is different for kids who attend schools that get the new math curriculum versus kids that attend schools that get the old math curriculum. But we have to attend to the fact that we have two different levels of sampling. We have observations within schools and then we have uh, multiple schools as well. So we've got within school variability in math achievement as well as between school variability. And what we do in a multi-level model is we write an equation for each one of those levels. So we'll start out with the within school variability and we'll say that the math achievement of student I within school J is equal to a school average beta naught J plus a deviation for that particular child within that school. So beta naught J is the average across students within that school and RIJ is how that particular student differs from their, their school average. So that's our within school model. And notice we have no predictors there in this particular model. We're just saying there's within school variability and there's between school variability. And then at level two, we express that between school variability. And we say, what is it that leads schools to be different from one another? And in this particular model, we're gonna express those school means as a function of treatment. So gamma naught naught is gonna be the average level of math achievement in an untreated school or a control school. And then gamma naught one is gonna be the difference in math achievement associated with being in a school with the new math curriculum. And then U naught J is just whatever's left over, whatever between school variance persists after accounting for those treatment effects. So some schools are high performing, some schools are low performing. All right, so that would be our model for the data. Now, how do we account for the dependence in the data? Well, it's through this term right here. This is, a, is referred to as a random effect. That's the random school effect. And because it has just the J subscript, not the I subscript, notice that it's gonna to contribute to the math achievement score of every student within that particular school. All right, so we could take all three of these terms and we could substitute them in for beta naught J, and U naught J would affect the math score of any student I that shares that particular school J. So if you have a high performing school, higher than you would expect based on treatment status, U naught J is gonna be positive. That's gonna push the math achievement scores up for the kids within that school. And if you have a low performing school, it's going to be negative and it's going to pull that uh, math achievement down for all the kids within that school. All right, so that's our model. Our model is going to have four parameters. We have two gammas. These are our fixed effects. They describe average differences. And then we're going to have two variance parameters as well. So we're going to have the variance within schools, the variance of the RIJs, and we're going to denote that sigma square. And then we're going to have the variance between schools, u naught j, the variance of that will denote tau naught naught. And so we actually have four parameters that we're estimating in this model. We have gamma naught naught, gamma naught one, sigma square, and tau naught naught. I'll get that out of the way so you don't get confused there. And so those are the four parameters that we want to estimate in this model. We have two fixed effects and we have two variance parameters. And these variance parameters are very much like the residual variance in a, a standard regression model, but we have a different residual variance within school versus between school to reflect the two levels of sampling that exist here. 
All right, so now let's go back to that question of how few clusters may I have to get good estimates of these model parameters. Part of the reason why that question comes up is that the estimator that is sort of the workhorse of modern statistics is maximum likelihood. And maximum likelihood relies on asymptotic theory, meaning large samples. Maximum likelihood is going to yield good estimates for these model parameters when we have large samples. And in particular, when we have a large number of clusters. It's going to give us unbiased, consistent, efficient estimates that are neither going to be too high nor too low, are going to tend to approach the true values as our sample size goes up, and then are going to have as small standard errors as they can to give us maximum power to test our effects. So those all sound like good things. What's the problem? It's all asymptotic. It's all large samples. So in small samples, those properties are not assured. And in fact, in small samples with relatively limited numbers of clusters, the tau not not estimate tends to be downwardly biased. It tends to be too small. All right, so, so you might say to yourself, well, I was kind of interested in tau not not, those between school differences, how, how great those between school differences are um, even after accounting for treatment. But I'm not, not really all that interested in it. What I'm really interested in is gamma not one. So maybe I can tolerate that negative bias in tau not not as long as I get a good test of these fixed effects. Unfortunately, our estimate for tau not not goes into the computation of the standard error for the fixed effect. And so if our tau not not is downwardly biased, our standard error for testing that fixed effect is going to tend to be too small, and that's going to lead to inflated type 1 error rates, or a higher uh, than acceptable false discovery rate. We may conclude that we have a treatment effect where, in fact, none is present. So what do we do about that? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about techniques we can use to mitigate small sample bias to be able to use these models with as few clusters as possible. And I'm going to draw particularly on a, a review paper, a really nice review paper that was recently published by Dan McNeish and Laura Stapleton in Educational Psychology Review in 2016, and I'll, I'll post the uh, reference to that with this video. What they suggest is that by using appropriate procedures, you can get good estimates for your model and good inferences for your, your tests uh, with as few as 10 clusters. And so what are those procedures? Well, we, we drop out of maximum likelihood and we use an alternative estimator called restricted maximum likelihood. Restricted maximum likelihood, without going into the details, is designed to mitigate small sample bias in this variance component, in that tau not not estimate. And so by getting rid of the bias that we would see in that estimate, well, now we can get a more accurate standard error as well for our fixed effects. So moving to restricted maximum likelihood helps us by removing that bias. Unfortunately, it doesn't get us all the way there. Why not? Well, the standard errors for these fixed effects are computed treating these estimates for the variance components as if they were the true values. But of course, when you don't have very many clusters, you have a fair amount of uncertainty in that tau not not estimate. And that uncertainty needs to be reflected in the standard error, otherwise the standard error is still gonna be a little too small and that type one error rate is still going to be elevated. So we need to adjust that standard error and use an appropriate test statistic in order to get accurate inferences. The best method that we can implement was developed by Kenward and Roger, and so it's often referred to as the Kenward Rogers method. Uh, and that involves a slight increase to the standard errors of those fixed effects to account for the uncertainty in the variance component estimates, as well as using a t-distribution, a t-reference distribution for testing those fixed effects with degrees of freedom that are, are uh, sort of approximated based on the data in order to try to yield the most accurate inferences possible. And a fair amount of uh, research has shown that the Kenward Rogers method performs quite well even with relatively few clusters, according to McNeish and Stapleton, as few as 10. So our particular example of five clusters in the control and five clusters in the treatment is at that lower bound where we would still expect to get good estimates and good inferences using restricted maximum likelihood with Kenward Rogers, with the Kenward Rogers method of testing fixed effects. So that's one approach that you can use if you have a relatively few uh, number of clusters. It's not the only approach you could use. You could move to Bayesian methods of estimation where you use prior distributions to help stabilize those variance estimates to try to obtain more accurate credible intervals for fixed effects. Um, but Bayesian estimation is a, a whole other ball game and so we don't have time to get into that 
uh, at here. Now, what if you had even fewer clusters? What if you had fewer than 10? What if you had only five clusters? Well, then a multi-level model probably isn't going to work very well for you. And you may instead opt to use a fixed effects modeling approach. That's something that uh, Patrick and I often recommend in that context. Now, a downside to a fixed effects modeling approach is that it's not going to give you the opportunity to look at between cluster differences in the same level of detail as a multi-level modeling approach. But when you have a relatively small number of clusters, you may not be able to do much at that between cluster level anyway. So with only five clusters, it's hard to make inferences. With only five schools, how can you make inferences to an entire population of schools with any degree of certainty? So a fixed effects modeling approach may be useful in that context, and we'll expand more on the differences between a, a multi model with random effects and fixed effects modeling in a subsequent office hours video. Thanks very much for your time. I hope this has been useful.